Hello everyone and good afternoon. So, I must thank Exchange for Media, I think for bringing out this important subject for discussion. Uh, the topic is, I think, sharply focused. I'm going to sort of focus my attention on not media investments and all of that, but just on what should the media agency of tomorrow be, or what will it be, and what should it be, so that you know, it continues its preeminent position in the AM world. Now, for a bit of perspective, the media agency first appeared in the world in France in 1968. It then moved to the US in the 1980s. And it took about a decade for it to finally arrive in India in 1985 when Procter & Gamble first appointed Madison to be their media AOR and soon thereafter and really soon in a few months Lever appointed Hindustan Thompson which later became Group M. Perhaps many of you or maybe most of you in this room do not know that the arrival of the media agency in India and bundling, unbundling, as Anurag recalled just now, it was the buzzword then, created a storm at three years of I, of which I was an executive committee member. And we spent almost two years discussing at the 3 A's of I platform and outside over innumerable whiskeys as to how to stop this unhealthy trend which had taken root in Europe and US from taking root in India or from growing in India. But as they say, you can't stop an idea whose time has come. And ultimately, three years of I gave up trying to resist this idea. And in fact, a few years later, created a new category of membership at three years of I called media agencies. Today, in fact, media matters dominate our discussion at the three years of I executive committee to the extent that creative agency heads almost feel left out and don't want to attend three years of I EC meetings. When WPP's creative agency CEO, or so I'm told, protested to Martin Sorel about this unbundling and the creation of Group M, he's supposed to have famously said, the toothpaste has left the tube and it can't be put back. Today, I'm told, media agencies contribute the highest amount of profits to global networks. I dare say, media agencies have grown in importance over the years, and this has happened not just because media agencies got lucky, but because media agencies around the world and in India have kept up with the times, with the changing environment, the changing media landscape, and responded adequately to meeting the advertisers ever-changing needs and rising demands. Very often, as many of you will agree with me, unreasonable. 
If I am to track the pitch presentations made by Madison Media every year to our clients and prospective clients, I can see how every three, four years, and of late, perhaps more often, there has been a dramatic change in the content of our presentations as well as the composition of and background of the teams that present these. This was, in fact, sharply evident to me last week when I was present at one such pitch. Now, the question that arises in my mind, and I'm sure that is what provoked Naval and Anurag to pose this question, is will the media agency of tomorrow continue to enjoy this preeminent position in the advertising and marketing industry in the near future? The answer to that, I believe, will depend on how open we are to further change and the speed with which we will respond to the rapidly changing media landscape and the rapidly changing needs of our brands in what is becoming for them a very competitive market. All of you know this, but let me show you just two graphs on how our media landscape has changed so dramatically in just last five years. Traditional media, and many of you have heard me speak on this at the Pitch Madison annual report in February every year. Traditional media was just 82%, was in fact as high as 82% in 2017, and as now in 2022 is expected to come down to 63%. Digital has doubled in market share in the last five years. And those of my friends from print and television and radio and outdoor industry sitting in this room will know how difficult it is to move a one percentage share point at a macro level in an industry. And in that environment, digital has more than doubled its share. Print, on the other hand, has come down from 35% to 21%. TV, mercifully, has held on, but early signs of stress are surfacing with Bach registering a decline in viewership. One can complain about Bach figures, as very often my media friends do, and dispute them. But as you know, studies like Bark always catch the macro trends rather well. What happens in the West, or in fact, around the world, is often seen in India a few years later, and travel time is reducing by the day. This chart makes even more dramatic reading. Globally, and I quote here walk figures because I believe they are the most reliable and independent source for us, for global addicts. Their digital accounts for 56% of the global addicts of 881 billion. All of you note, until recently, we used to talk of a global market of 600 billion. Right under our nose, in a few years, even globally, ADEX has moved up to 881 billion. Significantly, 
print globally is down now to just 6%. India and Germany are the last two bastions of print where there's a share of about 20% compared to the global average of 6%. TV, once the dominant medium in the world, is also down in the last five years from 39% to 29%. This is an interesting chart I've put together, and I've not seen many others do this analysis, put together to highlight that digital, besides standing tall on its own feet at 56%, has now penetrated every other medium and accounts for 20 to 30 percent of other media. In print, in the form of advertising on print titles, web versions, connected TV, digital OH, and digital radio. So really, digital is all pervasive. It has now entered every medium, and now every medium, obviously, is trying to introduce either separately or integrated with it a digital offering. And mind you, the global digital figures I've quoted here are standalone digital figures. If you added the print and OH and TV, con TV part of digital into digital alone, then the digital contribution, I think, goes as high as some 67%. Conventionally, we've held the view that digital is great for bottom of the funnel and TV, ideal, for top of the funnel. Because TV is more cost efficient and better at brand building and creating the pull factor which ultimately helps in building large, profitable brands, whereas digital is a bit more expensive, great at pushing sales, which invariably is a bit more expensive, though the results are more immediate. However, with the rapid emergence of digital branding options and our two digital behemoths, building a body of knowledge on what works in branding and what doesn't work on their platform in creative terms, and opening more and more interesting options and offering products to advertisers to experiment with, things I feel are bound to change. It is widely acknowledged, now coming down to brass tacks and the media agency in particular, that traditional media has been simpler to plan for, to buy, execute, and administer compared to digital media. The arrival of digital media and its rapid growth has indeed brought in a lot of complexity for media agencies. Planners and buyers of traditional media like TV, print, radio, outdoor, have shown <coughs> considerable resistance to fully immerse themselves in mastering, planning, and buying for digital, thus giving rise to the emergence and growth of standalone digital agencies or digital units or divisions of media agencies. At Madison World, between the two agencies, Madison Media and Hive Minds, we have 685 media planners and buyers, but there is still unfortunately a divide between traditional and digital with now almost 65% dedicated to digital. 
even for very large accounts whilst there are integrated teams there still are digital experts within the teams let me now come to the heart of the matter and outline my thoughts on what media agencies and should do to continue their preeminent position now as we all know ours is a people business and the most important thing for us is to have the right talent it should be a matter of some concern to us to all of us that today none of us can afford to hire from the country's premier management institute the institute of management amdabad look at this chart which shows offers received at the indian institute of management amdabad in 21 by business segments knowledge businesses like consulting bfsi and technology account for 74% of total offers we are missing on this chart and didn't we all think that we were also in the knowledge business the british created ics i'm taking you back a long time to administer their colonies the indian government adapted that to create ias the indian administrative service and the tata group created tas to generate a pool of people to administer and manage the growing tata organization we need to create mass a media administration service or whatever other name you fancy but to start with we need to get high quality at the core the mass cadre of people as i see it need to have hands on work experience in advertiser companies and creative agency and some exposure to at least one of either a digital first business or pr or content or analytics whilst it will be difficult for us to start from scratch and create these people at entry level i think such people could join the media agency or we could hire them at mid level with a fast track to the top this is because i believe at the cxo level at our agencies we need people who fully understand branding how it works more equally importantly brand finances and other such aspects that concern a cmo and ceo in advertiser organizations this is required and necessary in today's fast paced world to adequately back our recommendations on spending millions and millions of rupees to our clients i believe it will not be enough in the near future to be a media expert as you begin to occupy higher levels in the agency of course we need to hire data specialists data scientists martech professionals and content creators at entry level we need to have a mix of both math men and mad men and critically we need to move to integrated planners 
who are totally conversant with the opportunities in digital and digital benchmarks on CPM, CPC, CPB, and what not, and all the other opportunities that digital can offer. <coughs> Perhaps for this, engineers are better suited, and we need to tap engineering colleges. Equally, we need to expose our digital planners to the vast body of knowledge that planners of traditional media have acquired over the years. Our trainees from day one need to be exposed to all media, traditional, digital, outdoor, and activation. In our agencies, we need more cows and less milkmen. This is not my original phrase, but a phrase used by David Ogilvy many, many decades ago, when he saw that agencies were beginning to hire more and more fancy account executives than creative people and media experts. He cautioned his agency managements that, look, you're making a big mistake. This, in my view, if you are to heed that advice, we would make way for a leaner, meaner organization with higher capacity to handle more business at more competitive rates and good profitability, hopefully, which clients will love. Let me briefly talk to you about financials. I know possibly agency financials do not concern many of you, but here is a chart that plots the gross margins of some sectors like insurance, restaurants, entertainment, broadcasting, IT services, cable TV, and of course, advertising. No surprise that advertising is on the extreme left and has the lowest gross profit margin of 26%. As this chart shows, lower contribution results, of course, in lower revenue. As you can see in this chart, Accenture is in the right-hand top corner, high on both gross revenue and gross margins, whereas the agency networks are at the middle level in terms of gross margin, but extreme left in terms of gross revenue. So it tells me that agency networks do a hell of a lot of more work, but for very little to gain in return. Because of this, the market cap of, say, a consulting company like Accenture, as this chart tells you, is 15 times that of agency networks. And agency networks trade on the New York Stock Exchange at a multiple of 10 to 13, whereas Accenture at 25. Now, whilst it's true that we are in the people business, I feel we also need to standardize processes, automate them, convince our clients that when they come to us, this is our standard format, this is our standard way of doing things, and you have to follow our way. We can't be creating a different system and a different format and a different way for every client who comes to us. We need to harness technology and artificial intelligence to replace as much as possible human talent 
and use that scarce, scarce human talent only when technology can't help. There was a time when the bedrock of advertising was insights unearthed through quantitative and qualitative studies. Today and tomorrow, we need to master the art of uncovering insights through data mining. Take a look at this interesting chart I have, which gives you the top 10 most valuable brands of the world in 2007, 17, and 22. Notice that in 17 and 22, all the brands that dominate this list, all, without exception, are those brands with one thing perhaps in common, and that is they collect more first party data and mine such data to uncover insights to develop cutting edge strategies. At one point it was thought that global learnings are the most valuable thing going in the world. And they can be used in any market which would provide great competitive advantage to their owners. Many multinationals who entered India discovered to their peril at great cost that this was a fallacy, at least in a diverse multicultural country like India. Local insights, of course, are inevitable. I was delighted to read recently that Thumbs Up, a local brand launched 45 years ago in 1977 and then acquired by Coca-Cola, is still going strong and now a billion dollar brand. Indeed a tribute, in my view, to the pioneering spirit of Chauhans of Pale and their product development and marketing genius. When I started Madison way back in 1988, my belief was that a good agency is a small agency with a few large clients. And I dare say I stuck to this belief for a fairly long part of Madison's life. But today, we have to recognize that the world has completely changed. Small is no longer beautiful, large is. So indeed, we need to scale up. The mushrooming digital agencies in India could consider mergers amongst like-minded people to retain their entrepreneurial instincts and yet achieve scale, which will help them attract talent, invest in talent, other resources, technology, and data. I will not be surprised if after the aborted initiative of merging Omnicom with Publicis, which some of you may remember, there is another effort somewhere, sometime soon, since the need of the hour for networks is to reduce costs on milkmen and administration, reduce debt burden, and invest more and more in technology. As we need, as we know there is a need to invest in talent and technology to reinforce and improve our capability, there is, of course, a simultaneous and growing need to increase our profitability because only then can we improve our delivery and improve our ROI to our clients. But I don't expect, nor should you, our clients to help us in this process. In fact, in the last decade, I have noticed 
that since they can't do too much about prices of sugar or milk or steel or oil or whatever other raw materials they use, which in most years have inflated, they have found it experience to expand the scope of their procurement teams to agency fees and media costs. In the process, stunting agency talent pools. To my mind, we will have to learn to fend for ourselves. We are ourselves to blame for the situation we are in because I believe we have forgotten to say no to clients. It's not the client's fault that he wants lower and lower commissions, give lower and lower increase in fees and whatever else. Because if we don't look after our own business priorities, nobody else will. To me, agency profitability is more important than market share for agency sustainability and growth. In fact, growth of the entire industry. In my view, I ask you a question. My view is obvious. Is it better to be the world's largest agency with poor profitability or better to be the 100th largest or the 10th largest in a market but with good profitability? Profits are essential not just for the promoters and shareholders but for the agency to invest in expensive resources and technology so that it can remain competitive and survive and grow and not allow somebody who is more resourceful to take over the business. See the story of Infosys and G. I believe it is re very relevant to all agency managements. At one point in time, in the maybe in the 90s, Infosys had become over-dependent on G and a third of its revenue came from G. G continued to put downward pressure on rates to Infosys. Infosys took the courageous move to say no to G. And then what happened? Did Infosys collapse? No, as we all know, they in fact went on to become bigger, enjoy better margins than their competitors over the next decade. And you know what? G continues to be Infosys client. Another point, for too long, advertisers and their consultants have held us accountable for output like rates, CPRP, GRP, reach, frequency, and whatnot. I think the time has come where we should consider making the bold move for taking responsibility for delivering outcomes. Initially, in terms of increase in brand health parameters, but ultimately in terms of sales. This, to my mind, is not just risky, but complex to arrive at a fair, attributable system to agency actions. But I should think, in today's technology-backed world, it should not be impossible. This, I believe, would pave the way for better remuneration and bringing us closer to the top table. India, as we all know, is the land of entrepreneurs. And there are millions of small businesses in India who are profitable and growing. At least 
10,000 or 20,000 of them are candidates for becoming our clients in the near future. Many of them reside in metros, but equally many reside in the top 50 cities in India. The real power of India lies with them. Take a look at this chart. I can't vouch for its accuracy, but I believe directionally it is correct. Google derives 60% of its revenue from 30 lakh such advertisers, not from our clients. I don't know if they can even be called advertisers today or we will recognize them as advertisers. But remember, at one time, Nirma, Gadi, Viko, all of them were only on the fringes of advertising till they burst on the Doordarshan screens and monopolized. That time's Chitrahar, Full Khile Hai, Gilshan, Gulshan, and the Sunday feature film. And thereby, built large businesses for themselves, which are thriving even today. Even if we don't go down all the way down in this chart, there are 35,000 advertisers who contribute 20% to Google's revenue. We should think of how we can tap into many of these and convert them to our clients and help them grow their business. Not only will we be helping ourselves, we will also be helping speed up India's race to become a $5 trillion economy. And now let me come to my final point. And I'm glad even Anurag referred to it in some way. What's in a name? you may say, we should know quite a lot indeed. Given the length and breadth and the comprehensive almost end-to-end -end services that most media agencies offer, and we are continuing to expand the scope of these services and even enter the creative area, I believe we should substitute the word media in media agency with the word marketing. And since media continues to remind us, especially on the 3 of i platform, when it comes to sequential liability, that we have guys principle to principle agreements with you, I think we could consider substituting the word agency with company or consultancy. Don't you think if we are called a marketing company, we would move closer to the top table, attract more diverse talent, attract more clients, and hopefully be remunerated better. Thank you guys for listening to me.